Welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet and I'm here with Rachel Madel. What's going on, Rachel? Not much, Chris. I have a story to share today. Pretty serious story, actually. All right. Tell, I, I, I have a feeling what this might be. I'm really uh, interested in some details. I'll ask you some questions, I'm sure. Um, so tell us your story. Okay, so um, I just kind of went public with some information about uh, my personal life, which some people may have already saw, I kind of posted on social media, but I wanted to talk through it a little bit on the podcast just because I feel like we have a platform to share. And I also love the idea of connecting more personally uh, with our audience. So uh, basically, this is a journey that I've had for over the last six years. Um, I just recently found out that I was living in toxic mold. So I've had a slew of health issues that have just gotten worse and worse. And I have been to 16 different doctors in the last six years trying to figure out what's going on. It started off pretty subtle and then, you know, ended up I started losing my vision and started losing sensation in my hands and feet. I've had like really really terrible pain in my joints and my hands and my knees and all different kinds of other symptoms with digestion and skin issues and rashes. And so I just wanted to talk about it openly on the podcast because for a few reasons, one, perhaps someone also out there is struggling with um, a health issue. And I always feel like when you hear other people um, talk about things, you can you can connect with them the same way that we, you know, encourage all of the families that we work with to find a network, to find a community because they are not alone. Um, if you're listening to this and you have a chronic health issue, you are not alone. I feel like There were so many times throughout the last six years that I felt really alone and I didn't I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't know what doctor to go to. I didn't know, you know, what book to read or I was doing lots and lots of research trying to figure out what was going on with my body. And sure enough, it ended up being toxic mold. So that is why I'm actually in Hawaii right now. So a lot of people know that I'm in Hawaii. Um, They've seen some posts. We've kind of talked about it a little bit on the podcast, but um, I found out that where I was living had toxic levels of mold and I had to go back and get rid of all my stuff. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't really have belongings anymore. (laughs) So where could I go to heal? And I felt like Hawaii was really calling me. I came out here for vacation in February and it just feels like a really healing place. And it has been, it's been wonderful. I've been going swimming in the ocean every day and being in the sunshine. And it just feels really nice to be able to rest and try to heal my body. Um, It's still kind of been a struggle on the health front, but things are definitely getting better and I also feel so so good that I actually have an answer for what was going on because for so many years I just felt like I had no control I had no answers as to like why my body was you know reacting to so many different things so I don't know I'm just sharing publicly about my experience and it's been it's been a little scary it's been like very vulnerable to share about my personal life so openly Um, but like I said, I think it's a way, a way to connect. I think it's a way to potentially help other people. And, um, I just wanted to share, you know, authentically and openly about the last six years have been a serious struggle. So let's start with this question here, Rachel, and that's how are you feeling now? I mean, you've been mold free for a while now, so have the symptoms subsided? Are you, you know, how how are you feeling? Well, so great question. It's been um, it's been kind of up and down. I mean, definitely leaving that environment was the best thing that I could have done. And I I didn't know for so long that I was living in a place that was toxic. Um, So that definitely helped remediate some of my really acute symptoms. So I was diagnosed with what's called mast cell activation syndrome. And this was a few years ago. Um, Basically, it's just your body is responding with, it seems like you have an allergy, right? So like you, I had full body flushing, I had rashes, I had kind of this weird sensation in my throat, like all these things that would appear like I have an allergy to something but there's no true allergen and it can be caused by anything. It can be caused by sunlight or exercise or a food or, you know, it just felt random. So randomly I'd be sitting somewhere and all of a sudden one of these reactions would happen. And so that's how I was kind of living my life for like, 
a few years, went to a lot of doctors who said like, this is not curable. We don't know enough about this. And, you know, try to take some like H1, H2 blockers, some histamine medications that you would take for allergies. Um, and that was like, it felt like that was it um, until I started searching and diving a little deeper and kind of not being, um, not feeling like that was a good enough answer for me, not feeling like, you know, I'm just going to surrender to living a life of fear and just not knowing what's going to happen when I go on an airplane or I walk outside. And so that kind of led me to the journey of figuring out like it actually was there was a root cause for, for this and it was living in mold. Can I just interrupt you there for a second and say that also seems to parallel what we've heard from parents uh, in talking about AAC, where some of the times they've heard from other professionals and they thought, that doesn't seem right. You know, their their own intuition is what they ended up following. And then then and they kept pressing until they did discover what was right. And it sounds exactly what you did there, too, is like, but there's got to be something. Let me do my own research. It took a lot of time, and a lot of effort, but it seems to be paying off. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, so if you go to my blog, rachelmadel.com, you'll see an article and I wrote an article and, you know, of course I talked about my experience, but then I also paralleled to what lessons it taught me about the practice that I do. Cause I felt like there were so many parallels that being one of them. Um, I also think that, you know, it, it shows that we can't just say, okay, we tried this one thing that's enough, right? Like sometimes we need to keep trying and keep working and believe that change is possible. And I felt like at the, the very core foundation of my spirit, the last couple years was like, I know that I can figure this out. Like, I know that this is not right. I know that there has to be something that's causing this. And I felt like I believed that change was possible. And I feel like we have that parallel with the kids that we work with. Um, we have to believe that like, we will find a tool. We will find a system. We will be able to support kids so that they're able to make progress and they're able to succeed. And that was something that I felt like was a huge kind of aha moment for me. The other thing that I thought about was living with this for years at this point, um, you start to just feel like you're not in control of your own body. And I feel like that's what kids with complex medical needs feel all day long, every day. Some of my kids, you know, they have epilepsy, they have all types of medical conditions that they don't feel like they're in control of their body. Some of them, you know, don't have control of their body, right? They can't, you know, scratch their face if they have an itch. And there's so many things that my eyes open to experiencing personally, like I didn't have control of my body. And I just feel like we need to be really aware of that because sometimes we kind of come in and we're like, we have all these targets and we're like, yes, like we're going to work on, you know, the core word go today. And if our kids are in bodies that like they can't control and they're not feeling well, and they're not able to tell us, you know, they're not in a state that's ready that where they're ready to learn. Right. They're really just trying to get their, their body under control. And I feel like what that has made me realize and something I was already doing, but I'm definitely more cognizant of is teaching kids how to advocate for what they need in their bodies. And that means like we need to teach kids about their body parts and about feelings like hurt and sick and tired and, you know, really give kids the tools language wise to communicate to us what they need um, before we kind of barrel in and start teaching all the concepts that we think they need to know. Um, kids need to be able to self advocate for what they need in order to be ready to learn. And I think another point there is that you have your own agency to decide I'm going to move out of my apartment and I don't I, I'm not going to try and clean all of my stuff. I'm going to pitch all of my stuff because I might not be able to to actually do it effectively. And students don't have that choice, right? Oftentimes they have they're where the adults have placed them and they don't get to have that. And so having that awareness, again, is kind of um, a, a thinking through, well, okay, maybe some of these behaviors are related to the environment, not necessarily choices that the student is making. Yeah. And the other thing that was kind of the, the last parallel for me was... I'm sure nobody knew, right? N none of our listeners knew that I was struggling with this because I wasn't open. I, I didn't share it. I was like in the, in the thick of it. And I was like, just trying to survive from day to day. And so I feel like we need to have compassion for the families that we work with because we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, if they didn't do their, their homework or they're not using the device, you know, it could be that there's some type of extenuating circumstance that's prohibiting them from having the, the bandwidth to really focus on those things. And so I think that it's just a, a reminder to give great 
grace and to be compassionate for, you know, something that we may not even understand or know that a family is experiencing. Um, just because I feel like that was given to me oftentimes um, when I wasn't able to meet a deadline or I like came back to my email and I was like, I'm so sorry. It's taken me so long to get back to you. You know, behind the scenes, I was like, it was hard for me to get out of bed. I was, you know, sitting in waiting rooms at doctor's offices, um, trying to kind of manage my practice and, you know, all the other things I do outside of my practice and, you know, trying to like figure out what's going on with my health. It's like every night I would get home from work and I would just like go on like PubMed and like research journal articles and try to figure out what was going on. And so it's just like sometimes families don't have the bandwidth to focus on communication because they have more pressing medical needs going on with their kids. And we need to understand that um, and to really give grace. Rachel, um, when you were able to to move out of your apartment, had you considered moving like back to your mom's or, you know, going someplace else, going to family that you could stay in? And I mean, it seems like um, that's a, that's an intense move. Like you had to change your, your whole life, you know? So yes, I mean, it was, I was kind of in a place where I didn't know what to do. And I felt, I've always felt like in the last six years, I've always felt like my best days, despite feeling pretty bad most days, my best days were always when I had time outside and I was able to swim in the ocean. Um, and so that was really what was guiding my decision. Um, would it have been great to go back to Pennsylvania and to be with my family? Like, absolutely. Um, but I felt like, okay, I think I need to go somewhere where the ocean's easily accessible all year round. And that was what kind of spurred it. And it just felt like the right decision. And so I don't know how else to explain it other than it was like I was drawn to Hawaii and I'm so happy to have been able to come here and you know the nature of my practice at this point is I'm still doing a lot of telepractice and I do a lot of consultative work within teams I do a lot of coaching and I use a lot of video modeling which is actually easier virtually than it is in person I just pull up a video I share my screen and we go through it um, and I'm able to really be effective, the most effective in that way. Um, and so I just feel so grateful that, you know, I'm still doing telepractice. I have my team of clinicians in LA and I've been back to LA, you know, obviously I need to go back and do things for, you know, my practice and I'm doing assessments and things like that. So I feel like it's been, it's been nice to be able to kind of work remotely <laughs> um, because I've been able to be here. And the other nice thing about Hawaii and the reason that I felt really compelled to come here was because of the time difference. So typically by the end of the day, I'm so exhausted. Um, I also have, I've lost some of my vision, which I'm hoping comes back, but it means that I have to enlarge all of my font. It means that it's really straining for my eyes to see what's on my computer screen. And by the end of the day, it's even harder um, just because all day I've kind of spent using my eyes. And it's the same thing with, you know, our, our kids who use eye tracking, right? It, it's just fatiguing. And so what's nice is that like, if my day ended in, you know, on the West Coast time at like five, that's two here. <laughs> so it just feels like I'm really optimizing. I mean, I have to start work a lot earlier, but I'm actually like a morning person. And so it's actually been so nice because I'm done my day. I can like go walk to the beach, go for a swim or a surf or something like in the water. And it's been awesome. So like, because in private practice, I work, I work nights. I work like after school hours. So it's like, that's when I see most of the clients that we see. And, um, it's just been nice to not, to not be done work at like six or seven or like by the time you get home, it feels like eight. I'm like, what do you mean? Where's my day? And I still get up early and start working in the morning. So it's just like cut my work day a little shorter and it's just been really nice. Yes. That's healthy too, right? Yes. Well, excellent. It sounds like a really good move. I, let me add, ask one last question because other people might be going, well, like you said, I, I have chronic illness or there's some sort of weird thing that's happening and I can't really explain it. I've been to doctors and they, what was the final thing they kind of led you to mold and what advice would you give people that are like well how do I explore if that's something that's happening in my life it's not as simple as like pulling back the uh the clothes in your closet and seeing if there's like little black dots someplace on your wall right yes it was all invisible which is so scary to think about um and actually there's I think I don't know the exact statistic but I think it's around 30 percent of people don't have the ability to make antibodies to mold which means that you can have 
you know, a whole family living in a house that has mold and one person can have severe symptoms and the rest of the family doesn't necessarily have those symptoms. And that's because, you know, people who have the ability to make antibodies can better detoxify when they're in a toxic environment um, versus someone like me. I just had a series of, you know, pretty devastating health conditions that came up as a result of that. Um, So my best advice would be, to keep trying to uncover every stone because I felt like that is how I eventually got to mold. Um, You know, I did a ton of other testing of like, do I have like heavy metal toxicity? Do I have, you know, is this a hormone issue? Is I just did so many different kind of areas. Is this autoimmune? Is this? So I went to all different kinds of doctors. um, And unfortunately, a lot of my experiences with the doctors that I saw um, they just were like, nothing's wrong. They like, cause a lot of my labs would come back normal. And so they were like, it's, it's fine. You're fine. And I was like, trust me, I'm not fine. <laughs> I am not fine. I know that I'm not fine. Um, and so I think it was just like my persistence to continuing to figure it out. Um, the other thing I'll say is that no one cares about your health the way that you do. And so you can go to the best doctors in the world, but you really need to empower yourself and educate yourself to figure out what is going on and you take all of the information you're getting from all these experts right but then you have to figure out how how it resonates with you if it makes sense to you if you feel like that's what's happening in your body um just because it's it's everyone's best guess in a lot of ways right it's like finding all of the pieces of information and putting those pieces together um so the reason i went to 16 doctors is because i wasn't happy with what they were saying and like every doctor gave me a little nugget or a gem or like a thread that i could start pulling to figure something else out which was really helpful but you know i was really persistent in trying to figure out what was going on and i will say that a lot of my discovery happened when i started exploring more like alternative health routes you know so i started to see a naturopathic doctor i started like starting you know reading about that and um you know how can we look at the body as a whole system because part of the problem was i was going to an endocrinologist a rheumatologist like all of these different silos of medicine but they weren't always looking at me holistically and so i think that's one of the benefits of like you know a more naturopathic holistic approach. But really, I mean, I was the one who had to educate myself about all these things. Um, And so if you're dealing with chronic health issues, I feel like the best thing you can do is learn. Um, Learn about what's going on. If you get diagnosed with a specific condition, one of eventually what I got to was like any condition I got diagnosed with, because, you know, mast cell activation syndrome was one of many diagnoses that I got. Um, And so then I would always look up that and like natural, like, natural treatments um, just as a way to get some more information outside of just like, you know, um, like Healthline and like all these things that just generally come up when you're searching for things. Um, And so that was really helpful. And I think just like really learning and listening to lots of different opinions and doctors and reading lots of books. And I even did like Toxic Mold Summit. It's like this like thing for doctors that doctors go to. I was like, I'll sign up for this webinar series. (laughs) So I just feel like I was really passionate about figuring it out. Um, You know, I also will say, I'm making it sound like, you know, I did all these things and it was like so easy. It was one of, it was the hardest thing that I've ever gone through. Um, There were days where I would cry and not get out of bed and feel like this is going to be my life forever. Um, And so I think the same way that we think about this when we're thinking about our kids with complex communication needs, that mindset around what we're doing is the most important thing. Um, So times where my mindset dipped into this really scary place where I was just like, I'm going to live with this the rest of my life and I'm never going to be able to live a normal life. And this potentially is going to get worse and get life threatening. And, you know, that story that I was telling myself, I need to be really cognizant to not continue that narrative because it wasn't serving me and it wasn't going to help me get better. It wasn't going to empower me to find, you know, what was really going on. And so that is like what helped me the most was, you know, surrounding myself with people that kept my positive energy, that kept the outlook, that kept me like hopeful that things were going to change, that I would figure out this, you know, information. And so I think it's, that's the most important thing is like the mindset around what we're doing, that you can get better and you will find answers. Um, And just having awareness when you start to tell yourself a story that, you know, that's really negative and, you know, not serving you.
Uh, let me ask, what can you do to prevent it from happening again? Meaning, um, I'm thinking, and we should tell people, we just got accepted to present together at ASHA. Uh, so we'll be there. Our first ever in-person pre... Well, I mean, it's the first, second time we'll ever even have seen each other in person, but we'll be presenting together. And um, it, it it makes me wonder about, well, you'll, you'll likely be staying at a hotel or an Airbnb or someplace like that in D.C. How do you know that, 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 that there's not toxic mold there? And that's the problem is like it's very and what I've learned is that it's very common. And so I I don't know what the statistic is, but it's like one third of buildings in the U.S. like have some level of mold. Um, And again, it's not as serious if you have the ability to detoxify it. Um, So that's been part of it, too, is like I came to Hawaii and I feel like I'm actually in an environment that I feel good in. And I feel safe in. And so I'm like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I need to get some headway on healing before I like move environments. Um, of course, like I've been going back to LA and um, having to do business things and um, it's scary. But I think that ultimately I have kind of the the testing. Uh, there's like a testing kit that I can do. So if I, you know, wherever I decide to go next, I feel like I can always test the same way that I tested my apartment. Um, but I also think at this point I'm in, in tuned enough with my body to know when I walk into an environment that doesn't that doesn't make me feel good. Um, but again, I was living in it. So it was like, I didn't know. I just felt like crap all the time. Um, so that was part of it. So, I mean, you're right. Like, I'm definitely going to have situations where I'm probably going to be in a moldy space. Um, now I have the tools to know how to get the mold out because that's what I've been constantly working on is like, you know, taking all types of binders and things that can help kind of excrete it. I do a sauna every morning, which can also help get, you know, all types of toxins out, but especially mold. Um, so it's just kind of like I need to live my life, try not to live in fear, but also be cognizant and vigilant about like where I'm going, especially if it's like a long-term living situation, um, like if I'm, you know, living in an apartment, buying a house, something like that, I need to be just extra vigilant that there's no issue. Um, Because the problem is if there's any water damage in a building at any point, this could be something as simple as a leaking air conditioner or a little drip under a faucet. Like that can just cause huge problems. It can get into your ventilation system, which I am convinced that was what was happening in my apartment. And it's invisible. Like you would never know. Um, Now, there happened to be visible mold. Once I started moving all the things out, there was like mold on the baseboards. And I was like, how did I not know this? I lived in a beautiful apartment in Venice Beach. It was, you know, expensive. It was gorgeous looking. Like you never would have known. But eventually, like, you know, once we figured it out, I was like, oh, okay. So I started, it started coming out, right? After I was moving furniture and like basically trashing my entire apartment. Um, So it's just like, just knowing that it can be invisible and that we need to be, you need to be aware um, that could be causing like rogue chronic health conditions that you're not even sure that there was a cause for. um, Cause that's what happened to me. Like I said, I got tons of diagnosis of tons of different things. And I was like, what is causing all this? This is just coming out of nowhere. Like, it just feels like I'm a healthy person. I eat healthy. I exercise. Like, I meditate. You know, I do all the right things. Like, why am I so sick? Um, So I feel like that was kind of what drove me to just, like, not take just all these doctors' opinions as far as, like, it'll never get better. There's nothing wrong. I was like, that's not true. (laughs) I need to figure out what's going on. Well, I got nervous there for a little bit because the symptoms started to happen mostly after you and I had met for the last three years. So I was a little nervous that it might have been me, but I'm glad to hear that it was mold and not and not the not us or the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, honestly, like it's been such a journey and I, there's definitely some some people in my inner circle, you incru- included, Chris, that have known about my struggle that I've been open with and honest with. And um, without that support, like I wouldn't be I wouldn't have been able to get through it. Um, and so thank you and thank all of my you know close friends and family for being so supportive, because like I said, it was just like such a struggle and I really needed Uh, positive energy and that hope sometimes when I was feeling, you know, like there wasn't any. Well, we, I I think I speak for everybody to say that um, we're super, super excited that you are healthy, you know, and that you're, you found what the answer was and you can be addressing it and working towards a positive solution. 
Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to share this. I definitely would recommend sharing this episode if you know anybody who's dealing with chronic health issues. Um, Since I have found this out, I feel like so many people have come into my life and I've actually been able to help them figure out that mold was like a root cause of what was causing so many problems, uh, which is part of the reason I decided to share so openly on the podcast um, and on social media and my blog about my experience. Because if I can help just one person figure out what I spent years trying to figure out, then, you know, it was totally worth it. So hopefully this helped you guys. Feel free to reach out to me if you're like, I wonder if mold is causing my issues. Um, Please send me an email. I would be so happy to help you. Um, Like I said, I just, I wish someone had like, you know, I heard a podcast about, I mean, that is actually how it happened. I did hear a podcast and I was like, mold, huh? I was like, this is interesting. And that's how it happens, right? You like are living your life and then you hear one thing and you're like, wow, this sounds very similar to what I'm experiencing. Um, So anyway, please share this episode if you know anyone who's struggling with health, um, a health challenge. Tell us about our interview. Super excited. Amanda Soper, she's amazing. I had a fantastic conversation about cortical visual impairment with her. Um, We've had other guests on the podcast come on to talk about CVI, um, which has been super helpful because I think it's an area of our field where most clinicians, myself included, feel very intimidated, feel like there's tons more to learn and that I don't know enough. And, you know, our kids can sometimes go years without getting diagnosed with CVI um, and they're struggling with AAC. And so um, the conversation that I had with Amanda was really great because she's super practical. She's a practicing clinician and she she got real with me. And I, you know, to be fair, I actually reached out to her because I was struggling with one of my clients. And so you'll hear me talk about one of my clients very frequently in this episode because I have so many questions. And what I love about her is that she just, um, you know, she's in the trenches with us clinicians trying to, you know, figure out how to support, best support kids with CBI. Um, And so I think all of her input was very practical and um, you can start using those strategies that she she shared right away, um, which is something I always love because you know I feel like at this point like I know a lot of like high level things about CVI I know the you know the signs of CVI I know basic strategies right but they're they're you know as you're working through these things with a specific client things come up and you're like okay, but now what do I do? Like, I don't really know exactly, you know, what, if I am thinking about salient features, like what, what, am, what does that actually look like? You know, like I know it's something I should do, but like in practice, like what does that actually look like in my sessions? How do I coach teams on, you know, using salient features? So spoiler alert, she's going to talk about that. <laughs> that was a specific question I had. <laughs> um, so anyway, really excited to share my interview with Amanda Sober. Great news, everybody. We're going to be presenting a pre-conference workshop for Closing the Gap called Designing and Delivering Empowering Experiences to Teach Language Using AAC. This six-hour virtual workshop takes place over two days, October 7th and 8th, from 1 to 4 p.m. Central Time on each day. This interactive workshop explores strategies for teaching students of all ages language by engineering environments so all communicators have opportunities for rich, meaningful practice in the context of everyday routines. Participants will get to explore how to design experiences using interactive technologies, which empower the student and their support network, putting them on the path to achieve their lifelong language goals. During the workshop, we're going to take an in-depth look at building the skills of communication partners through structured training centered on both consulting and coaching. We'll be sharing the latest tools and strategies for establishing a culture of language learning using AAC. Everybody loves engaging tools. You can sign up now by going to bit.ly slash design AAC. That's bit.ly slash design AAC. Can't wait to see you guys there. Oh, and there's one more thing to mention, Rachel. What's that, Chris? I'm actually doing two pre-conferences on those days. I'll be presenting with the other authors of the new Inclusive Learning 365 book as well. The title of that pre-conference is Inclusive Learning 365, Breaking Down Barriers and Creating a Culture of Inclusivity by Design. 
That pre-conference is also on October 7th and October 8th, 2021, but it will be at 9 to 12 Central Time on those days. If you'd like to learn more about how to redesign educational experiences through an inclusive lens, then you can register for that pre-conference by going to bit.ly slash inclusive CTG. That's bit.ly slash inclusive CTG. Come spend the whole day with me. See you there. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined today by Amanda Soper. Amanda, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me here. Super excited. We're talking all things CVI today, which is an area that I think all of us uh, need some more information on, some ideas. Um, So can you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm in Washington, D.C., and I work for a charter school that is entirely special education. Um, All of our students have IEPs, and the majority have pretty complex medical, motor, sensory needs. Um, Over 130 of our kids, I think, right now use high-tech AAC, and the number keeps climbing every year. I also work a little bit in EI doing AAC evals, and I'm teaching the AAC class at Gallaudet right now. Amazing. I didn't even know you had experience in early intervention. I feel like that's the second podcast episode. <laughs> I like am really passionate about like getting AAC started earlier, or at least starting to have those conversations. Um, but like I said, for another day, we're going to have to have you come back on Amanda and talk about early intervention. Yeah. I'm obsessed. So sure. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So let's start off by just talking about some of the, the red flags. Um, I think that like, you know, we, we kind of know in a general sense, um, you know, what cortical visual impairment is. Um, and we've definitely talked about this on the podcast, but I think that one, it's worth reiterating. Um, and just, you know, from your lens and your experience, um, what are some things that we need to be looking out for um, when we need to, to think, uh, perhaps I need to refer out, um, perhaps this child might have cortical visual impairment? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so I will be really honest. I didn't have a TBI at my school that I could refer out to. So a few years ago, I did take the Perkins like CVI class and I'm working on my CVI endorsement right now. Um, and I'm in a master's program for TBI. So it's kind of where this knowledge is coming from. Uh, but there's really like three main criteria or features, red flags, if you will, that you might see uh, that might kind of trigger, hey, I should refer out for this. So the first one is fairly easy, right? You notice there's something not quite right about a child's functional vision. Um, They go to the eye doctor and the visual function is normal. There's nothing structurally wrong with the eye, um, but you know there's something going on with their vision. So that could be a a red flag for CVI. And then the other one, after reading the CVI book uh, by Dr. Roman Lancey, there's an entire chapter about like medical causes of CVI. So um, typically like it's caused by a neurological condition. So brain trauma, brain conditions, um, really if there's just a lack of glucose or oxygen to the brain. So a ton of diagnoses fit under there. A lot of those chromosomal disorders. So honestly, when I like do an intake for a student, if I see those diagnoses, it's like a red flag for me immediately before I even see the student. Um, Or if I'm seeing the student and I'm noticing something, I might go back and be like, oh, well, they do have all these diagnoses. So maybe that is CBI. And then the third one is what I think most people probably know about is those 10 visual behaviors or characteristics um, that you know, kind of characterize a person's vision when they have CVI. And so the presence of those visual behaviors could also lead you to think, hey, I should refer out and see uh, what we can do here. Can you give some examples of what those behaviors are for people who aren't familiar? Yeah. So it could be like having a color preference. Um, My favorite one with my students is like a need for movement. So for a long time, I could not figure out why they were like constantly moving around as we were presenting things or they were like holding something up to their face and shaking it over and over again. Um, Like making the movement or using movement helps them to visually process what they're seeing. Um, It could be some visual field deficits. There's another big one that I find in AAC that usually clues me in is uh, it's called like absence of a visually guided reach. 
So students have a hard time looking and reaching at the same time. So because there's two different parts of vision that you're using there. So they might look, look away and then reach. So sometimes for AAC, that might be causing mishits um, or you're like, you don't really mean to say that you're not even looking at the device. Um, so those are just kind of some of the basics. And then I guess another one that probably most SLPs are encountering is that difficulty with visual complexity, right? So whether it's the visual field is too complex, the array, the environment, um, there's like a lot of different nuances with that visual complexity. Yeah, I, I want to circle back because I feel like there's two things that you mentioned that I think can can uh, present um, differently. And I think it could be an underlying cortical visual impairment. Um, the first was um, the movement piece, right? Both moving their bodies. I feel like kids who are moving their bodies constantly um, and also what appears to some as might be stimming, right? As like holding up something that lights up and, you know, shaking it yeah. towards their face. Um, I feel like that is oftentimes, um, well, they're just stimming right now. Um, and in the second piece, um, not looking, not looking at the device while they're activating it. I think um, we just assume that children are not paying attention um, and have, you know, poor attention um, when in fact it could be an underlying CVI problem. Um, and so I think those two things are worth calling out because um, so often I think we just assume that a child is stimming um, with a toy um, or, you know, has ADHD and are running around the room um, and all these things that could just mean um, there's something going on visually. Um, and I think that that's super important to think about when we're thinking about our kids. Um, and I think what happens, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think that sometimes we just aren't seeing success with AAC. And so we automatically assume like, well, the child's just not ready or they're just not attentive or they're not motivated by anything. Um, when in fact it could be, they're just not visually accessing, um, the system and they can't have consistent success with the system. Um, if we don't take the CVI into consideration. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great point. And honestly, that's usually one that sticks out the most for me. I have so much SLP guilt for students that I've been like, oh, they're stimming or like, I'm not really sure. They don't really seem to be looking. Um, I have a particular student that has had a device since she was three and she must be eight now because we are in the process of getting her another device. And in her initial classroom, she was, and this is crazy to think about, like she was using 84 sequence, Unity 84 sequence masked, but using it, but she was in like a, a quieter pre-K, right? A lot of the other kids were in wheelchairs and also nonverbal, and there just wasn't a lot of movement happening in the class. And she switched classes, stopped using the device completely, like couldn't seem to use it at all. Um, it never, see, that never occurred to me, never occurred to mom. Mom was like so upset that she stopped using it. Her older sister also uses Unity 84 sequence. We ended up bumping her down to 45, like one hit. I was like, I don't even know if this is the right device anymore. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it occurred to me that she might have CVI and we did a CVI range assessment. I had a TVI come and help me with it. Um, and it's crazy. It made a huge difference. We started putting accommodations in place and honestly, like the pandemic was a little bit of a blessing. She ended up being at home, right. For a year and in this really quiet environment. And within three months, she started stealing her sister's device to have access to the unity 84 again. She wanted like more, she had more to say, and the environment was less complex and she could kind of handle that extra um, like need for visual attention at that time. And she's back in school now and still thriving. So um, it really, it makes a difference to know because there are strategies that you can put in place so that you can get back to where you want or just pivot and go in a different direction. But yeah, I feel really bad that for years I was like, she's stimming on it or she doesn't pay attention to it. I just, I don't know what to do with her. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we can all relate to like SLP guilt. It's like, we know better now we do better, but like, what about when we didn't know better? <laughs> I feel, I look back yeah. on those things and I'm like, ah, I feel yeah. really bad if I think about it for too long. But uh, I think the most important thing obviously as clinicians is that we're always learning and growing and evolving. Um, yeah. And it's just like, we, we know better now, so we do better. Um, but I can totally relate to the SLP guilt. Um, yeah. I've, I've, I've done it way too many times and I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Wow. 
oh, I should have known about this. Um, But (laughs) if you're listening to this podcast, it means that you're trying to seek out information and you're trying to learn more about CBI. So um, that's all we can do. And I'm really excited to have your insight, Amanda, and also super helpful for you to share that story. Uh, I'm curious, what what do you think was at play? Do you think it was the environment? And if so, what were the strategies that you started implementing knowing um, kind of the initial diagnosis? Um, how did you pivot the plan and the system potentially and the strategies to kind of meet her needs? Yeah, so I started... Um pulling her out more instead of pushing into the classroom. So when reintroducing or introducing, I guess, a new overlay, um, we did a lot of pull out or like when other kids, you know, went to the cafeteria, if she came back a little early, I would sit with her in there where it's kind of quieter. That really helped just, I think the complexity of the environment was just too much for her. Like she could not focus. And looking back, it makes sense, right? Like her pre-K classroom didn't have a lot going on in terms of noise and movement. And so that's probably why she was more successful then. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other piece was really trying to play to what I knew she like visually recognized or really loved and had like strong preferences for. So she's pretty obsessed with singing, (laughs) um, loves to sing. And so she's memorized like all of, you know, in a classroom, they have all those picture cards with all of the songs written on them and picture icons. She knows what all of them are. Uh, and so she had memorized them. So I put all of those songs on her device and gradually she started asking for them in busier and more complex environments. All the kids are there and she's still going five little ducks, five little monkeys, um, hello song. And uh, so then we kind of knew too, like, okay, she can use it in this complex environment. Let's bump up a little bit more like what we want her to do. So using visuals to kind of help show her, this is the icon we're looking for. And then the other big thing is describing kind of those salient features of the icon. Um, So I know, I feel like this is kind of taboo with uh, Unity systems, but I describe the icon path for her. So I might say, you know, hey, we're looking for, we're going to say eat, we're, you know, having our snack. You might want to tell me you want to eat or that you're hungry. Remember those words are in our our red apple button on the bottom left. We can find our red apple. If you want to tell me eat, it's our green action man. If you want to tell me you're hungry, you can use our blue adjective button. Um, And using things like that has just really helped her get getting that like auditory information, the location on her device. Um, And then when she gets it, she gets it. She doesn't need those cues anymore. But as she's learning vocabulary, it's, it's been really helpful for her. I love that because I think that we hear a lot about salient features when we think about cortical visual impairment and like, what does that actually translate to in our practice? Um, I think that's where the leap is really hard for clinicians to make. Um, and I love this, this strategy of yours where it's like, well, one of the first things we can do is kind of do like a think aloud, right? We do that already with students right. um, who are learning AAC, like, mm, it looks like you're reaching for the cookies. I think cookies might be in the food folder. Like let's go in the food folder and see right? We do that already. Like, let's add some salient features when we're doing that think aloud. So kids are able to track and follow knowing that auditorily, they're typically stronger than they are visually, um, you know, especially as they're going through the different ranges um, of CVI. So I love that strategy as a practical way to like really start with salient features. Um, Thinking about salient features, um, since we're kind of on the topic, I'm curious what your thoughts are. um, And if you have a systematic way to target this, um, especially when we're working with kids with receptive language difficulties, um, because my, you know, obviously salient features are really important, but what if kids don't understand the language that we're using when we're, you know, using the strategy of talking about salient features. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts or ideas on that. Yeah, I have a couple and I also have like a little tangent path. I want to go down about them. Um, so the first is for salient features. I have tried really hard for a lot of our students with cortical vision impairment at my school were standard items. Our therapy team, mostly the OTs and the speech therapists and some of our teachers have kind of come up with a dictionary. It's like, these are the ways that we're describing the salient features of these objects, right? When we get out our scissors, hey, we know those are scissors. They have two loops and a blade. Um, When we get out our cup, oh, remember that's our, our cylinder with a rim on it. Like we're all using the same language then. So that I think has really helped our kids with significant receptive language deficits. We're not all describing things with how we think those are the salient features. Um, 
I really highly recommend if you're going to have, even if you only have one student, like thinking about that dictionary, because there's a lot of people who work with that one individual and you kind of want to be consistent, um, really teaching them in context, the, you know, using the items that you're talking about. So don't, I don't really love when people are just kind of like showing a fork and almost like a discrete trial way, but you're not even eating. Like there's no, I think it's easier to kind of build those paths and make those connections if you're using it um, like in the moment or in the activity. And then honestly, just like a lot of concept building. So a lot of those salient features are basic concepts and our speech team has been talking a lot about it this year as we're getting more into CBI that we really haven't been focusing a ton on some of these really basic concepts, but now we're expecting kids to know, you know, Hey, it's the big one with blah, blah, blah. Or like, it's long. This is short. This is a round curved tail versus a straight tail. Um, so we've really been talking as a team of just kind of making sure what we're doing and how we're supporting teachers is so that they can be building on those concepts and helping mm -hmm. students really learn what those salient features are. Um, did that answer kind of yes, that question? Yes, it gave me like so many ideas. So just sharing a little bit about my personal experience with salient features, um, what I do with teams is set up a shared spreadsheet. So, you know, we have the word and then we have, like you said, the salient features that the entire team is expected to use when, you know, targeting that specific word. Um, and so I think that can be a huge time saver just because it's a shared resource. We can keep adding to it. Everyone's on it. Everyone knows it. Um, and it just brings the team collectively together doing the same thing in the same way. Um, as far as the con conceptual knowledge, I feel like absolutely. Um, and I think that that's where um, potentially, you know, speech language pathologists can really hone in, um, you know, in a collective team effort. Okay, it looks like from the salient features chart that we're looking at or the shared spreadsheet, it looks like there's a lot of references of size concepts or, um, you know, spatial concepts and all these things, colors. Um, and so making sure that we can target those things, obviously in meaningful ways, um, but making sure that our students understand. Um, I also love that you talked about using um, and doing this type of activity in an actual natural context. Um, because like, if we actually want any skill to generalize, we know that it has to be meaningful and natural and not like super contrived and like not natural. And so I love this idea of kind of, um, being an observer, I think in the classroom and seeing like, what are they doing? Oh, they're doing arts and crafts. So like, we're going to talk about scissors and the crayons and all these things. Um, my follow-up question to you is thinking through that lens, how are you incorporating the AAC into that? Are you doing a lot of modeling with that? Or like, what does that look like? Yeah, so that's kind of almost the tangent I was gonna uh, go down with the last question. So here's where like, I think I disagree a little bit about salient features and, and AAC. And I wish I could remember where, I think it was at ASHA last year. Um, Karen Erickson explained it like way better than I'll be able to, but a lot of TBIs are, um, have asked or are advocating that we're using symbols that match the symbol hierarchy or the representation hierarchy that their student, they feel their student with CVI is on. Um, as far as AAC goes, a symbol is a symbol. <laughs> uh, most systems at this place, at this point, um, have things in a consistent location, right? I'm not really teaching the visual representation of the symbol. Like, I don't necessarily care <laughs> that you know this red thing is an apple. I care that you know when you hit this red thing and the green button, it says E. And when you hit this red icon, circle icon, and the blue button, it says hungry, right? Like, I think the focus from the vision team is really on the symbol and the focus from me as an SLP is on the language. So I'm really using salient features more to describe the pathway, what the icon is, I'm labeling it. Mm -hmm. um, I will occasionally, if I have a student, so I've had some students who are like in phase one, um, so from the CVI range, you know, don't use their vision a whole lot, but they also have so many motor difficulties. The only access method they have is eye gaze. Mm -hmm. um, and so for those students, sometimes what I've done is pulled the symbol out and maybe we're putting the symbol on a big light box. And I will talk about the salient features of the symbol just so that they can 
like better recognize it and have a better understanding of what the symbol is. And then when we're using it on their talker, they have a better idea of like what I mean when I say these two hands coming together to represent more. We've talked about it. We've done the motion. We've gone over the salient features. So yeah, kind of like two different things there. I do talk about the symbols for kids that I think really are not processing much of what's in the symbol itself. And I'll do that outside of the device. Um, but in general, I find that I use salient features in AAC to describe the icon path or to label it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that sometimes when we're on teams, we do have kind of competing interests. Um, at, obviously, as speech language pathologists, we're focused on communication and we think through the language lens. Um, and um, TVI, just for people who might not be aware, teacher of the visually impaired, um, I know that, you know, there's a lot of listeners who are like, CVI, TVI, what are all these acronyms? <laughs> um, so just wanted to clarify um, when Amanda was talking about that, teacher of the visually impaired, and their role really is to teach um, that visual processing and to really help a student start accessing their uh, environment visually. Um, and I think you're right. I think sometimes we do have uh, com competing Competing interests um, in that respect. Um, I'm curious, um, have you worked with TVIs on uh, which, which, you know, vocabulary you're selecting? Um, I think that that's where I kind of come into um, some confusion on my end, because whenever I'm thinking about any type of vocabulary that we're going to outright teach, I'm always thinking through like a functional lens. Like I don't want it to be super random, um, like an elephant, if a child never sees an elephant and like elephants aren't meaningful and relevant to them. But um, the other side of me thinks, well, um, there's a lot of salient features with an elephant, right? They have like a long nose and big ears. And so I'm like, is that, does that make sense from the vision side? I'm not sure. So how would you answer that question? Like, how do you decide what vocabulary do you work with the TVI to figure out what's like functional and relevant, or you just kind of let them like, you know, use their expertise and like, you kind of just try to support whatever you can as far as the language side. So I think here is where we kind of continue, at least some of the ones I work with that we've kind of continued to disagree and agreed to just disagree. Um, so I'm happy to support ta like learning about the elephant, right? And going over those salient features and helping to visually process what that is receptively. I'm not gonna focus on elephant on my AAC device when we live in Washington, DC, and I've never seen an elephant come down the street. I'd be quite alarmed if I did. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm still, I feel like as the SLP, my role is still to be thinking about vocab and what's the most functional vocabulary for the student. Um, and my job is kind of to advocate that that's the vocabulary they need to be able to express. And that's what I'm, I'm, I want the team or I want to help support the team to focus on that vocabulary. Um, I've definitely made some, you know, compromises, but another thing, right. If, if a teacher of the visually impaired is saying we need our student to have only picture representation, like photograph representation. Okay. So no verbs, no prepositions, no adjectives, no pronouns, right? Like you're just chucking most of language out the yeah. window. Yeah, you know, like you what need is it? An abstract 80, 80, 20, 80, 20, <laughs> yeah. forward fringe, like you're throwing yeah. away 80%. <laughs> yeah, so um, like it gets kind of tough and you just kind of have to have those conversations, I think. And um, I really love the main TVI that I work with. She's amazing and she's been mentoring me um, as I'm in my TVI program. And we've just kind of had those conversations about needing to balance a lot receptively and just working on visual processing, but also when we're using the AAC device, making sure we're targeting words that are the most functional and are going to continue to give the student like the most bang for their buck with, with language. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it, and it does feel somewhat challenging when we're thinking about more abstract language concepts, because we know that they, you know, one of the ways to know how abstract or concrete a word is to how easy is it to draw, right? Yeah. And so it's like uh, abstract language is hard to draw. And so we have to represent it with a symbol. Um, and so that makes the whole salient feature situation challenging, right? <laughs> because we're then describing this like, you know, all these features of this symbol. And then it's like, it just feels like they're, we're kind of just like 
running around the main point, which is like, I want to teach you what the word go means and how they get right. there. Um, yeah. Instead of teaching you like, this is an arrow and there, you know, it has a point and yeah. you know, all these things. <laughs> um, I like that you, for your students who are kind of lower on the CVA range, you're really like bringing that icon, putting it on a light box. Um, that's a really great idea. Uh, Cause sometimes I think um, I have a lot of students who are using, um, you know, Unity and the, the icon size is pretty small. And so I always think like, are you able to see it that small? Like, how, how is this working? Right. We know kids learn the motor planning, but, um, you know, I think that having that kind of on a like enlarged on a light box makes a lot of sense as a strategy that you can use um, for those kids who really aren't visually accessing a lot um, as a way to kind of start anchoring them like. Um, and, you know, teaching them what that symbol looks like large and then kind of making it smaller and smaller so that they're able to navigate their systems. Yeah, for sure. And I do want to say like for a lot of those kids that we're using those strategies for, so pulling it out on the light box or I'll have a bigger symbol representation to model with. So I'm not just pointing on the screen. I'm kind of showing this is the symbol we're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of those kids have made so much visual progress on the CVI range. Like they went from being in early phase one to late phase two, um, just using right in order to improve your vision, you have to use your vision. And yeah. um, so for a lot of my students using AAC has has honestly been one of the main reasons that they're using and improving their vision because we're giving them something that's really powerful, right? They want to communicate. They want to figure this thing out um, and be able to, you know, tell you what they're thinking. So um, yeah, I think just using those strategies has, has really helped a lot of our students in other ways other ways as well. I also think you bring up a good point, which maybe not a lot of people realize that this is something that can, can be corrected, right? Like this isn't something where it's like, Oh, we have CVI. And like, that's like the, the death sentence, right? Um, yep. we, when we use our vision and we, you know, implement these strategies and we do get kids in vision therapy and all of these things come together, then kids start visually accessing their environment and they improve, uh, which is kind of what the CVI range helps us figure out, right? Is like where on this range are, you know, students landing as far as what they're visually accessing. Um, and then that helps us kind of gear our strategies and the way that we're interacting with students and the kinds of vision exercises that we're doing with them. Um, it really helps kind of guide the team as to where to go and how to support them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> My next question is I, specific to a stu student that I have. So I want to talk through this little case study with you uh, and selfishly like get all your insight, Amanda. Um, so I have a student who was diagnosed, um, I believe it was like a year or two ago, um, but we're just starting to kind of learn what the impact of the CVI has had on his ability to access his system. Um, he's using Unity, um, but a strategy that he uses um, is he will try to, so at first when we started, he wasn't doing a lot of initiation. So we worked on getting him initiating. Then um, he, we found out that he really liked uh, acai. And so he would always go there. Um, and it felt like as if he was persevering on it, but then we realized he was going there as like an anchor to figure out where he was on his system. Um, so he would go there first and again, it appeared like, oh, like, no, that's not what we're holding in front of you, right? Like we were doing all that, like correcting. And then we're like, oh no, like that's not, he has a system. He has a strategy mm -hmm. here. Like he's compensating for like his lack of vision. Um, and so, you know, he kind of uses that as an anchor. Um, we're as a team trying to figure out, is there a way that we can um, create anchor, like, visual anchors for him on his device so that he's able to maybe not always hit that button. Um, and I'm just curious if you have any idea because he does a lot of um, like scrolling through the device. So he's push pushing the button, listening and being like, no, that's not what I want. Pushing the button, listening. That's not what I want. Um, he's doing a lot of that kind of scanning and listening. And then once he lands on what he wants, he'll repeat it and he'll kind of, you know, look up as if like, yeah, I landed on it. This is what I actually am trying to say. Um, do you have any recommendations for like him specifically. And again, I'm, I'm saying this selfishly because I need your help. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so it sounds like he's doing a lot of auditory fishing and I'm just wondering if he's really even using his vision with the system. Right. Yeah. Um, for some of my students that sound like that, um, we've worked on getting really close to the device. We've worked on positioning it. I'd be curious, um, you know, is the device flat on the table and he has a visual field deficit? Mm -hmm. uh, inferior 
visual field deficit, right? So it might be something as simple. I've had some kids, they're mobile and they're carrying their device and using a finger, but we've put it on a mount on the table because they need it to be um, like right in their central vision in order for them to be able to look up and and kind of use the symbol. So Mm -hmm. I think the first thing I would do is play around with the vision or if he had a CVI range completed and you have information about visual field preferences, I, I find that if that is something that can help, like that's an easy, an easy thing to kind of implement. And then another thing that I've tried So similar, I think, to what you're talking about, about like having anchors. Um, I've asked students if we can like pick a couple of buttons on the home screen that we turn a different color. Mm -hmm. Um, So like the more button is like a bright purple and the play button is like a bright green or something like that. And then when we're talking about the icons and I'm asking my student to use their vision not to I I think you're going to have to be pretty direct about like, let's try to look, not fish. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes that's helpful, right? Like, oh, you know, remember we're one of your toys that's in play. That's our green button that has those two dice on it. Mm -hmm. Or I forget what's next to play or play. But if like is next to it, oh, you know, hey, you're smiling. I think you really like that. If you wanted to tell me you like that, you know, like is our yellow sun. It's next to our bright green button. And sometimes those like really bright colors or um, some good visual anchors to be able to kind of move around the, the device. So this might sound like a silly question, but like what if students aren't demonstrating that they understand colors? Because it feels like um, that's a huge salient feature, right? But like yeah. what what are, what are your thoughts? Because I'm like, I don't know that this student actually confidently knows his colors. <laughs> so I'll be honest, I'm not confident that a lot of my students know their colors or like when I'm describing things by shape off. I'm really not convinced that they know that's a circle, that's a square, that's red, that's blue. Um, I feel like just by doing it repetitively and in sequence, like, I really don't know that, you know, this one particular student knows that this button is purple and this one is green, but I've used the word green in context so many times to describe where our toys are, that like is next to it, that don't is under it, things like that, that I honestly might not know that I'm talking about the color, but he's figured out that when I'm saying green, like, I mean, this area, this is the anchor that I'm, I'm kind of referring to. Yeah. Um, well, I think it just goes to show that like, we need to like presume that kids will learn with the right input. Right. So like right. the repetitive practice and the input that we're giving, like kids will eventually learn. Um, and so I think that's a really great reminder uh, to all of us that like we need to just assume that kids understand what we're saying. And because um, I think what happens is we're like, well, he doesn't know his colors. So like we're not going to use colors because that's going to confuse him. And it's like, no, like we need to like give that input and that language to kids, um, knowing that like with the right input uh, and enough time that kids will learn uh, that language. Um, so I think that's a really good idea. Um, one last question on the visual anchors. I love the idea of changing the colors um, is that something where you have like you know in every quadrant you have an anchor like how do you decide where it goes is it based on the vocabulary that you know is highly motivating and relevant it's like oh well like we're definitely going to put um, the eat button like it's going to be on one of our anchors because that's like a highly motivating uh you know word to use so how do you decide where you put those um so in particular i had just used play and more as examples i think and a big part of why they tend to be anchors that I use, and they are in two different quadrants, two different sides of the device. Um, they kind of blend in with that white background, right? Like they, those white dice, you see the blue outline and some little black or black outline and little black dots, but I think it kind of fades with the background. And so if I know, you know, the student always wants to talk about their toys and ask for things and tell me they want to play, tell me that I lost the game, they won. I want to make sure that they can visually access that icon. So I tend to choose icons that I think are a little bit more washed out or they're not sticking out as much to the student um, and trying to trying to get them maybe in different quadrants. Mm-hmm. But I really look a lot at what the symbol itself is and um, if it's one that I think a bright color could really help provide that contrast, then I want to add a bright color to it. Mm -hmm. And just another kind of important reminder for people who maybe haven't really learned a lot about CVI, um, the high contrast, like having a black background and bright colors, yellow, red, orange, um, all of that is super helpful when you're working with kids with CVI. And so even just like changing their system to have a black background uh, or a darker background um, can just be a game changer for kids in their ability to access their systems. Um, 
Um, this is super helpful, Amanda. I feel like I have some <laughs> strategies in my back pocket to go back to my team and be like, let's try this. Um, this was super, super helpful. Are there any other uh, resources or websites or anything else you'd recommend for people who want to learn more about CVI, um, specifically as it relates to AAC? Yeah. Um, so I would really highly recommend looking at the Perkins website. They have a lot of webinars that are about CVI and then about AAC and CVI. Um, I found them to be really helpful. And if like me, you were in an area that just didn't have enough TVIs to come and kind of support as an SLP, OT, special educator, whoever is listening to this, like you can become certified in giving the CVI rate, not necessarily in the intervention, but you can learn enough to be able to, to make those basic changes and figure out how to help your student. Um, so I really can't recommend that enough. Every state also has a deafblind project. Um, and if you look at your state's deafblind project, they usually have some really good resources too. Um, and they will come out to schools or come out to homes and it's a free, a free service, right? And they're coming out and they're providing assistance and they're providing training. Um, and then another one that I love is the Paths to Literacy website. Um, they just have a lot of really nice ideas um, for like language concepts and language activities. So I tend to use them a lot when I'm looking at AAC. Um, and then shameless plug, I'll be speaking at ASHA about AAC and CBI. And um, I'm doing some webinars for a semantic compaction system also about AAC and CBI. Um, Amazing. I'm going to be with you at ASHA, Amanda. <laughs> I already told you that before we started recording. I was like, oh my God, Washington, D.C., that's where ASHA is this year. Um, so yes, I'm excited to hear you talk about that. And I have to say, this has been an amazing episode that I'm super excited to share because I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed by CVI. And um, I think that I've definitely done a lot of the trainings that you talked about and they're super helpful. Um, but what I'm always kind of wishing for is like people get in the weeds, like practical, like we talked about today. Um, so I'm super grateful that you were able to come on and it was super helpful to hear um, all of your ideas and just kind of talk through cases because I think that's how we learn best is uh, when we're kind of anchored in like uh, a specific case that we're thinking about um, and the actual problems that come up when we're, you know, trying to optimize what we're doing with students with CVI. Um, and so thank you so much for uh, coming on. Um, how can our audience reach out to you if they're interested in learning more or just have a question? What's the best way to, to stay in touch yeah. with you? Sure. So I'm happy to chat with anyone. I'm pretty passionate about AAC and definitely CVI and AAC. Um, email is probably the best way. It's Amanda Soper, S-O-P-E-R-S-L-P at gmail.com. Um, so that's probably the easiest and best way to reach me. Amazing. So we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Uh, Amanda, thank you again for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you and I'm super excited to share this episode. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was it was really exciting to get to talk to you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm super pumped. We need more CVI episodes. So, and also I'm having you come back to talk about early intervention. <laughs> we need more, more, <laughs> more talk about early AAC too. So much more talk. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So for talking with tech, I'm Rachel Madel joined with Amanda Soper. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs>